it's going already. Um, and karma is also a vowel. All right, so anyway, session title is using big data uh, to inspire consumer confidence. And I just want to point out and I guess say thanks to the collision folks that this isn't called the AI stage. That's actually called big data. This is for data nerds, data science. But there, there is a bit of AI hype. Uh, the last panel was called Beyond the Hype. Um, so I just want to ask Ryan, what, what does he think of AI? I mean, is AI just another name for big data? It's a, it's a broad question. It's one that I could spend a lot of time on. My, uh, my quick reaction is, you know, AI I think is definitely overhyped. I think the promise of AI is generalizable intelligence, right. the ability to not only learn, but to reason, to pattern match, to interact. And I think what we have today is, is best described as artificial narrow intelligence. And uh, ANI is, ANI is actually amazing and deserving of that. And, and how narrow, do, when you use the, you say narrow, what does it mean? One thing, 10 things, three things? Very good at one very specific thing in a probabilistic fashion. So things like identifying a cat. We're very good at identifying a cat. We're very good at most things that have a big set of data coming in and then one specific output on the other side. We're not very good at making sense of a broad area of data or what we think of as intelligence. Mm -hmm. Like systems still can't do what a, a two-year-old can do. They can do the most basic things that a two-year-old right. can do. Uh, but I think ANI is actually very deserving of the hype because I think it's transformational to your business if you use it correctly and for us, I think it's actually a key part of our secret sauce. All right, and so let's get to that, that secret sauce, all right? So I, I trust people are familiar with Credit Karma. Um, you know, and, and the pitch, which you know, is give us some information, we'll give you a free, free credit report. And it's, it sounds too good to be true. I mean, why? And, and, and also, I, just to put this in scale, so you talked about 60 million users. Yeah, that's, that's ginormous, right? Uh, zero to 60, you know, a lot of different things we can say. But that is, they have insights and data on 20% of America's household debt. You know, that, that, that's a lot of information. So how do you get people to, to share this with you? It's, it's a lot of data. We have uh, close to 40% of millennials in the platform, one out of three people that use credit. So I'm sorry, 40% of millennials. Close to 40% of millennials in the US okay. are on our platform. Uh, about one out of three people that use credit in the United States use our product. Uh, and the value proposition is it goes beyond just showing you your data. Uh, you know, if you think about finance, it's just kind of a painful space. Like, it's a very one-sided market. There's no visibility into what's the best auto loan for you, what's the best credit card, how do you get money? If you need $500 right now, what's the best way to do that? And it's actually impossible to solve that, to solve that problem without having the credit data up front mm -hmm. because you can't tell what people will be approved for. So a lot of people came along and said, oh, I'm going to solve this problem by listing every bank, every offer on the internet. And what they found was that their conversion rates are like you know, low teens, high single digits for people who actually apply because there's no way to connect the people that will actually be approved with the products that they need. And so that's a big part of what our platform tries to solve. And, and, and but what about also just, you know, you said it's a black box, you get, you know, a three-digit score, you hope it's 800, but what if it's not? And what does it mean? I mean, it's like the SATs. You go, where do they come up with it, these, these numbers, these ranking systems? Yeah, it's a, it's a data problem, so we had to be a data company from the start. You know, essentially, credit score is a risk model, right? You know, the yeah. bank wants to know how likely are you to default, and that's what a credit score is. And back when, uh, you know, these sites first started coming out, they're very opaque in how they described, you know, what was... Uh, is that my mic? <laughs> and how they described uh, what was impactful to you and how you were being approved or declined. So we actually reverse engineered a lot of the credit score from day one, figured out what was most important to people, then bundled that into the product so it could highlight things about you that would be meaningful when you go to apply for a loan. And, and this, you know, we just, all of us probably just paid or avoided paying our taxes. And that was one of the applications of, I, presumably of, of all this data and getting people to share with you is um, they offered zero dollar tax filings so that you could get your taxes done for free. You know, H&R Block, 
teamed up with IBM Watson, big you know AI, big data, whatever, uh, and then you guys turn around and, and say, here, we'll do it for free. Well, I, a lot of it is kind of the same value proposition: is that you know if we were if we were able to create like a perfect marketplace, a perfect assistant that could connect you to everything that you need in your financial life, right? Uh, that that is a great way to like create a business and a product. So what do we need to do to make that happen? Well, we need to pull all that data together so we know enough about you to make recommendations that make sense. And so we gave tax away to America for free. This was our first year doing that. Millions of people used it, which was really exciting. And uh, we'll be able to do some cool things with it. So now that we have the data on both sides, the credit side and the tax side, we can do things like notice that you have a mortgage and point out that you, did, you forgot to deduct it on your tax returns. So there's a lot of cool, cool interplay yeah. between those two things. But, but so, so let's just go back though. You're 10 years old, okay? And, I, and, and not you, I'm sorry, the, the company. And you know, thinking about my you know, experience, I'll say you know, I, I'm old enough to know that when e-commerce first came around, people were reluctant to share a credit card number you know, on, on, online, you know, afraid of my being hacked, whatever. Um, so how, you know, when you guys were building Credit Karma, what, what, what were, how did you overcome that? You know, did, you know, even, even today, I'm sure people tell you all the time, this is too good to be true, I don't believe it, you're going to charge me at some point. It's, our, it's always been our biggest problem because I think consumers should rightly be a little anxious when people collect as much data as platforms like ours collect. And so from the very first day, we said, well, we'll just never make a decision that is not in the consumer's best interest. So even if I know something like, even if I know that a consumer isn't as good a credit risk for a bank and I have that on my side, I won't necessarily share that because it's not in the consumer's best interest. Like what we want to do is help the consumer get the best deal they can possibly get. Mm -hmm. You know, our whole mission is financial progress for the consumer. And everything we've done along the way has, I think, reflected that. And I think that that's why we have so many consumers and have built so much trust because we've never been on the wrong side. We've never sold anybody's data. We would never do that. And, and so thinking about the data itself and using that data to both earn trust and keep trust, you know, what, what, what are, I guess, signals you know, when, when you're presenting offers to people? What do they tell you? Uh, and and how, do you, how does data itself relate to that uh, very you know, important trust? Yeah, that's an interesting question. We, the, one of the hardest parts of this whole thing is because it's a free service, people assume that whatever you're offering is an ad. They assume that you're only offering it for your own interest. Right. But much of the time, we know that the consumer is overpaying on something. And the algorithm has identified that, and it's putting something in front of them. And we actually pick up on a lot of different signals from your behavior that tells us what to offer. So if I show you an auto loan and you don't interact, I take that as a sign that maybe you're not interested in that. Even but I, I might think that's an ad. But you might think, you probably actually will, because when uh, the platform will take that input, it'll say, oh, the consumer didn't interact, uh -huh. so we should switch it up. And the consumer thinks, oh, well, this is just an ad. It's not a, it's not a recommendation. You know, because if you ask your friend for a recommendation today, and you ask them for another one tomorrow, your friend is probably consistent. Right. Whereas our platform is using your interactions to change what it's doing. And yeah. So we have to actually be pretty careful with messaging and the way that we display things to give the consumer confidence that this, there's something behind this. And, and the stakes are high. I, I mean, or I'll say as a consumer, uh, I've increased anxiety. If, if you tell me that I'm 90% likely to get approved for a loan and I don't get approved for a loan, you know, that's kind of devastating <laughs> to me. Or 10% you know, of 60 million people who don't get approved for a loan. So I mean, how do you ensure that you're you know, spot on, I guess. Clean data, you know, the, what's... This is one of our earliest challenges, is that you know, most machine learning is probabilistic, right? So you take a bunch of inputs, you get a, some kind of number, like 70%, 80%, 90% accuracy, and it's like, at what percentage do you actually make the recommendation to the consumer if it's gonna make a difference to their financial standing? Because if you're wrong 10% of the time, yeah. you might have actually put them in the wrong direction. You might have actually harmed their standing. So we've had to be really careful and diligent with, you know, what's sort of the threshold beyond which we'll make a recommendation? What's the impact of that recommendation to the consumer? Uh, and how do we think about that from a data science 
perspective, because the stakes are higher than recommending a friend on your contact list. Mm -hmm. And then, what, does this lead to people to deactivate from the service, or? For recommendations, we don't get very many deactivations, but we do get, we still to this day, 10 years later, get deactivations because people think we're about to charge them. They cancel, they cancel with the reason that they, they don't want to get charged. On day 29 or something? Yeah. yeah, they actually have that calendar out. Even though we didn't collect their credit card, even we don't have right. any billing it. So. But, uh, and, and how about, you know, you, I know you, I read one of uh, said you guys are like processing, you know, 750,000 events in, 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 a, in a minute to create um, some of your calculations. You're doing 1,000 models a day? It's a, yeah, we'll, we'll test. Uh, about 1,000 models a month. Every model takes around 120 billion observations to process. Can you explain what a model is and what? Sure, so we, we model a lot of things, like the things that you interact with in the site, you know, basic behavioral stuff. We also model all of the underwriting for the banks that we uh, connect consumers to, so we try to figure out, you know, what can you actually get. So that's a, a pretty wide problem, considering the number of financial products that are on our platform. And so we'll try to make it so that if we show you something, there's a high confidence you can actually click through. And that means keeping up with the changes in all of these different uh, financial sectors throughout the month. So we try to you know, refresh our models as they refresh theirs. Right, and, and so what's been, I'll say, the largest technical or technological challenge? You know, from, and going from zero to 60, you know, this is Fast and the Furious here, right? Uh, one of the biggest technical challenges is the real-time nature of what we do. So uh, the consumer's credit gets pulled right when they interact with the app. So we get this giant credit file in the moment that you interact. And right at that moment, we need to actually process your credit against everything that we know so that we can make a recommendation. And we do all of that in about 20 milliseconds, a little less than 20 milliseconds. Wow. And so engineering that, you know, we started building that years ago long before a lot of the existing platforms were created. And so that was, that was very challenging. And keeping up with uh, you know, the pace of technology, you know, we've always kind of tried to stay on the, you know, kind of the bleeding edge. Uh -huh. uh, and, and making, sh with as much stuff as we've already developed, you know, continuing to advance is, is a challenging problem. And, and, and what about, um, you know, I'd say some of the competition or, or other, the introduction of chatbots? to financial services, and this idea of people using you know, a, a trusted digital assistant. Um, and the, you guys, as, as a brand, Credit Karma, you know, it's Googled more times than, than Geico. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and sort of, to me, that there's a little bit of a, a brand, and then there's also these chatbot things. Um, do they carry the brand, too? And, and where are they going to appear, and how are they changing FinTech? It's, yeah, it's an interesting space because a lot, of, uh, a lot of financial startups have focused on education and answering your questions. Yep. Uh, the problem with that approach is that people don't always know the right questions to ask. That's, that's a very common challenge, is just people just are unaware of how bad a deal that they're getting or they're unaware of what their standing actually is. So a lot of the educational chatbot space they kind of require some consumer initiation, uh, which, is a, which is a pretty big challenge. I still, I'm pretty bullish on kind of chatbots and some of those things. I just think that you need to have enough intelligence behind it that you can initiate the conversation and then get the consumer to follow up. Uh, and we have some like little things that we've played with internally to see if we can you know, guide the consumer down a path that we you know, very strongly believe is, is right for them. And, not, uh, not leave it up to them to digest, you know, a thousand articles or read through like a, an about.com style directory on a topic to know what to ask. And what about, so, so let's talk about your business for a second. So you're, you know, do you, where do you see expanding these, you know, overseas into new markets? I mean, the tax market is an eight point, you know, nine billion dollar a year industry. Um, Certainly credit bureaus are, are out there. You, there's no reason you, you have enough data to become a credit bureau. You can issue your own uh, reports, yeah, yeah. probably, maybe. We, we do have a lot of data. Being a credit bureau comes with its own challenges. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of regulatory stuff to worry about there. There's, uh, 
taxes, of course, uh, you know, was a huge undertaking. And it, actually, at the same time we were launching tax, we went international for the first time. We launched Canada just four or five months ago. Um, we're now the largest in Canada. Um, so there, there's definitely, I think, a lot of expansion to be done uh, just in, in terms of like addressable market. But uh, I also think we could just do a lot more along uh, different verticals in finance because right now we're very strong in credit card and personal loan and we're starting to add more and more. But I think that we're you know, just starting to see some of those things gel. Okay. And long term, I would love us to be at the center of every financial consumer financial decision a consumer makes, because we have such great breadth of market, we can actually look out and see what Home is... Home mortgages? Would you, is that I think definitely that should be, you know, that will certainly be on our agenda someday. I think uh, it's very likely that we go into a lot of, <laughs> all the major purchases in your life, right? So the, yeah. your home, your car, all of those things are very connected to your financial standing. And, and, and do you envision that it will always be free for the consumer? We'll always be free. That's, that's our, our core promise. You heard it from the all, read, read his lips, free. right? <laughs> yeah, that was right from day one. Yeah. You know, we're like, we have to be free. We have to be on the consumer side. Now let's right. figure out what the product's going to be. Yep. All right, so we're almost out of time. So w one last question then is, you know, make a prediction, please, about you know, big data and the future of FinTech, future of Credit Karma. I think if I were to make a prediction, I'd say, um, I think AI will have actually a tricky time because ANI is, uh, we understand how it's done, but we don't necessarily know why it works. So I'll be interested to see like what the next big leap is after ANI. But if I were to throw out like a specific prediction, I would say businesses that don't master the ANI space are really going to struggle. If they work in volume with consumer especially, I think you have to master ANI. You have to get really good at predicting you know, what's best for your consumer and what maximizes your, your business outcome. And, and for us, I think that a significant, a very large percentage of our business is, is directly tied to that. Outstanding. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ryan.